Monopoly sucks. Even though it's most people's first step into the wonderful world of board games, it does an awful job as a gateway game. It's too random. It lasts way too long. It's so boring once you get overrun by an opposing player. It's just not fun. If you've ever played Monopoly and have arrived at the conclusion that all board games suck, well, we're about to prove you wrong. Here are 10 picks from both of us of 10 games that are way better gateway games than Monopoly ever will be. My number 10 mm -hmm. is Diamond. Is that, is that why you put Diamond over there? That's why Diamond's <laughs> over there, yeah. <laughs> so this is a good pick. I, I like Diamond. Tell us about it. It is actually one of the best pushy luck games I've ever played. Cool game. And the new, new version has just come out, which is kind of made me fall back in love with the game. Initially I'd played it, I think somebody else's copy, and then kind of totally forgot about it mm -hmm. because I, I played some other Pushy Luck games and mm -hmm. I was like, Pushy Luck is not my mechanic. Mm -hmm. But then Diamond has come back out in this beautiful rendition. Yeah, it's not actually changed that much in terms of gameplay, has it? But no, God, exactly. it's beautiful. It is such a beautiful game, Gorgeous. like art, production, everything. Mm -hmm. And I think I actually like Pushy Luck games. The reason it's on my list of best introductory gateway games, as you want to call it, I think it does a brilliant job of introducing you into exactly that mechanic of Pushy Luck, which is used in so many other games. It is basically the gambling mechanic of board games without losing money, so hey, hey. All the fun of gambling without the risks of it, which is always a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's that factor of, oh, e, ah, am I going to do it? Am I not? No, oh, yeah. And sometimes it's not a payoff. Sometimes it's just, oh, no, I shouldn't have done that. Pushy luck games aren't necessarily about being the most competitive. When you first start playing board games, most people are, are probably not going to be that competitive. So I think it works perfectly as that style of game. It introduces players into like very basic mechanics that you'll find in tons of other board games, right? And it does it in such an exciting and engaging way. I, I can't fault the game. I actually think it's fantastic. And I agree with you the first time I played it. Did we play the Inca and Gold version? Have you heard about this? Ink and Gold version. They've, they've done another Ink and Gold version, yeah. which doesn't have nearly as nice artwork, but yeah. I, I read a BGG, some people recommend it because it's, it comes with the first expansion or something like that. Yeah. My personal recommendation is go with the one that has the nice artwork. Diamond. It says a lot about me as a person that I'm probably very superficial. He is. But Diamond, awesome pick. Yeah. I like it. I think it's cool. It's, uh, it may or may not be on my list. You're number 10. My number 10. This was one of our very first games that we picked up. I think actually I bought this game, which is surprising because you usually buy our board games. I'm not sure why that's Always the case, buy. You board always board buy the board games. Yeah. There's, there's a couple of games I bought. So I this think is you only buy 10 grand. <laughs> High Society. So High Society is the first bidding game that we ever played. And it's a really simple card based bidding game. It almost uses these sort of cards with absolutely gorgeous artwork. I yeah. believe it's a Reiner Kenitzia game. It's just really before we even knew him as like a designer and how like renowned and, and recognized he is as one of the sort of great designers in, in space. Bidding is one of my favorite mechanics for board games. And it's almost a universal mechanic because everyone kind of knows like how bidding and auctions work. If you've played the game of eBay, then, <laughs> <laughs> then you will be very accustomed yeah, to this. Exactly. So as long as you know eBay, you'll be fine with High Society. I've never seen this not really land. I think everyone just really enjoys this and it works so well as a gateway for us. One of the best things about it, without a doubt, is the artwork. It is yeah. one of the most beautiful games yeah. um, I've ever seen. In fact, it was more the artwork that sold it to me. I think it's the Brothers Murph and show this. I'm like, wow, that's a beautiful game. I don't care how it plays. It was just a huge bonus that it was actually a fantastic, fantastic yeah. game. It, it's portable. Like I've right. seen you take that to, to so game many Because it's so easy so to just pocket and, 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 and sort of take. Yeah. Has it not landed ever? I think the brilliance of that game, High Society, is when I take it and, you know, there's often times I go out to meet friends and stuff like that. And some of them just are like, I'm not playing board games. I don't want to do this. I'm just gonna sit here and be boring and watch you play board games and have fun. But those same people, it's like, no, oh, come on, just give it a shot. Just yeah. give it. And all I say is, it's like eBay the game. And most of them <laughs> are like, yeah. oh, well, okay, let's give it a shot. It always lands, let's play another game. Let's play another game. It is one of those games. It's universal. Yeah. This game is, is really one of the universal games. And I think that's the one of the sort of prime criteria hmm. for something that should be a gateway game. All the cards are in French. So all the items are named in French and People just love hearing me butcher French words, I guess. You usually butcher English words too, so. <laughs> words. Number nine is High Society. Sorry. He's already pretty much said everything yeah. about this one. We, we don't know each other's list, by the way. This yeah, is totally we haven't, like, looked, at we haven't looked at each other's list. It's a brilliant game. Absolutely agree with you. Yeah. I take it everywhere, as he mentioned. It is just something that always goes down well. 100% recommend that game. 
My number nine. I don't think you've played this. I don't think you'll have mentioned it on your list. Okay. It's Cult Express. I haven't actually. No, we've um, there's been a recent re-implementation of. Yeah, the game. it's the 10th anniversary, 20th anniversary, 10th anniversary, something like that. One of their anniversaries mm, was quite 10th. recently. It's the first time I finally got a chance to play this one. Cult Express is a is a programming game. I was a little bit surprised okay. when when it programming. It's a programming really? game. Yeah. Um, I played a, a bunch of other programming games before, mm. and I would call them reasonably complex compared to some of the other games on this list. Mm. But I think that's okay. I think this still works as a as a gateway game because I think good gateway games will then be a gateway to similar games of the style, regardless of, of its complexity. Mm -hmm. It just has to be approachable. Yeah. And I think this does it. And it's not, it's, it's definitely not the most complex uh, mm -hmm. programming game I've ever played. I think one of the best things about programming games is just how many wild laughs you will have when your plan gets totally screwed up because of how other people have programmed, mm -hmm. right? So, I mean, just to explain to somebody who's just like baffled by what a programming game is, right? So you basically set a, a path or, or a route or a series of actions mm -hmm. for your character or Mm -hmm. or, or your board. That may or may not carry out exactly how you expect it to because it will be determined afterwards if people have interacted with your route. It's mm -hmm. kind of like, I, I'm, I'm not gonna explain it any more than that because we can get really bogged down and, and scare people away. But that's kind of what you're trying to do. You're playing a cowboy on a train, mm -hmm. a running train. Yeah. So this already sounds exciting and the, the production of this looks so beautiful. It's like so yeah. grand. It's so exciting to look at. If you play this at a convention or something, 100% people are going to come and walk past and be mm -hmm. like, oh my God, what is that game that looks so cool? And you can move up on the train, you can move across on the train, you can move backwards on the train and you're trying to pick up loot. You can shoot other people so they drop their loot and then pick up their loot. And you're just having this big sort of wild battle between everyone, programming it all. Mm -hmm. But of course, none of it's gonna, ever going to go to plan. It's not a very competitive game and I think if you treat this too competitive, which most people are at the gateway level of board gaming probably aren't going to, then you're just going to have so many laughs. It's exactly what this game does. It is a generator of laughs. But at the same time, it's a, a proper board game. It's not just like some cheap party game. I'm quite excited to try this one now. I I've think seen I, it. I, I've you like you've, it. You've grabbed it recently. Yeah, so. yeah, you will like it. Um, I, I'm without a doubt, you will really like this game. Okay. Um, I'm surprised you haven't rushed off to play it yet. So I didn't know it was a programming game. It was, to be fair, programming games, I'm not the biggest fan, but there are certain games. I, I think you've played more than me. I played more than you, yeah. yeah. I've never played Robo Rally. You've played I've played Robo Rally, that's a fantastic game. Richard Garfield title. Mm. You think I'd jump on that, but... Yeah, I mean, he's yeah. just basically our, our favorite designer of all time, probably. Yes. Yeah. Magic. Yeah, the designer of Magic and, and <laughs> lots of other TCGs. Yeah. What was the one we played with the... the, the begin with the L. Lords of Zidit. Lords of Zidit. Which is a really underrated game. Underrated game. It's extremely Seriously underrated. underrated yeah. And then there's the big Mex brand. Versus Mix versus Minions. Yeah, yeah, I, which I, I really, really enjoyed. enjoyed and I think yeah. we need to go back and play okay. that one. I've enjoyed every mm. programming game that I've yeah. played. I've never really not enjoyed it. Robo Rally is a great one. It probably could have sat in the spot, but I think uh, Call, Call Express was just slightly simpler. Mm -hmm. So I think that's why it works really well. And I think Call Express probably made more laughs than, yeah. than Robo Rally. Oh, okay. And I definitely want to play this one now. Yeah. You've got me excited. It's, it's an exciting yeah. game. My number eight. Let's have a look. Stop peeking. You might disagree with my number eight, but I really think it is one of the more perfect kind of two-player gateway games, specifically in its genre. Not two-player only, it can be played with more than two. Okay. Best at two, and it's a small skirmish game. And it's a great gateway into the skirmish genre. My pick is Unmatched. Yeah, it's Unmatched. I actually totally forgot about Unmatched mm -hmm. in, in this. Um, I actually think it works really great as a yeah. gateway game. It's actually one of the ones I, I sort of consistently recommend people who are new to, to the hobby, who come into the shop. One, because it takes up tons of shelf space because they've got this, it's like a big expandable system, right? Yeah, Unmatch has just consistently been producing like great product after great product. I, I got a bit bored of the Marvel series. Mm, yeah. Mm. Although some of the Marvel characters were quite good. They were good. But they, there was too many Marvel. Mm. I think they, they had too long a span of like Marvel characters yeah. where they should have done some other characters. But then they kind of came back with the whole Unmatched Adventures, which is probably the best product Amazing. today. I mean, it's just gone from strength to strength as a match yeah. from its two-player system up to this cooperative system that it's introduced. Yeah. Speaking of adventures, you've got Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles yes. coming out soon for yes. adventures. Yes, I'm super excited. All the, you know, I, I'm so excited. It is a good time to be into it unmatched. What did you think of the co-op version of Unmatched? Original Unmatched? 
just no no sorry the uh, unmatched adventures because we adventures yeah adventures yeah loved it loved it it was actually really good amazing um it was in fact our first video you know we did the top five games of the year or something and it was my pick for, for the video yeah as well, so. I, mean, I can't disagree with that pick yeah. actually it deserves huge amounts of credit the co-op is so much fun you can still play that competitively and it's still just as fun the characters were amazing in it it's not the hardest system in the world no. it, i think it's pretty straightforward the foundations of the simple egg incredibly simple yeah they, they can tell you the rules on one card of paper literally yeah is it worth mentioning bruce lee versus muhammad ali <laughs> is coming to unmatched that's crazy like i, I missed mean, out on bruce lee I know. and i'm so upset about it at the time but i'm so happy that it's coming back with yeah. muhammad ali with muhammad ali that, that's probably going to be the best unmatched of all time isn't so it? excited yeah i'm super so excited. excited brilliant game Go check it out. Go check it out. All right, man and Bray. Oh, stop Whoa. it. Are you in these nip slips? If it isn't on your list, you're going to be like, oh crap, why didn't I put this on my list? Pitch cars. Yeah, maybe forgot. it's on my list. Is it on your list? I might have to make some changes. <laughs> um, okay. Pitch cars is uh, my favorite dexterity style board game. A racing dexterity game where you build a track. It's almost like those ski electrics tracks that you build, but it's just a wooden board and you have little wooden discs and you mm. flick them about. It sounds absolutely ridiculous, but I've never seen anybody have anything but intense amounts of fun when they play this. It's so simple and it's a concept that everyone understands and it always blows people's mind as well when they think about board games because they kind of don't expect this dexterity style game yeah. which is about racing it's it's just it's immense fun it is so much fun seeing everyone fail and everyone succeed it's almost like that excitement you get from like crazy mm. golf when you like finally get that one hit and like crazy golf is almost designed for like you know you can you can do it in one putt mm. if you really wanted to it's not necessarily true about crazy yeah. uh, um about pitch car but when you do get that like amazing flick yeah. it's just so satisfying like the whole Oh, like table would be like, what have you done? How did you do that? That's so crazy. It generates those moments so beautifully. It's such an exciting game. The only real downside to it is one, it's availability. Then getting the expansions is near it's, impossible. It's expensive as well. Yeah, it's not a cheap game. Justifiably expensive because you've got real components. Yeah, components, proper wood components. Proper in it, wooden yeah. components. It is a European produced game. Yeah, so they, they manufacture it. Yeah, France manufacture well, yeah. in France. Okay. So I still think the price justifies the fun that you get from it. And I think that's probably the way to rate this game. Table presence. The crazy. table presence is really cool. Yeah. This is bound to get people past the gateway and be interested interested in, in the hobby, so yeah. I, I couldn't recommend it anymore. Oh, kicking myself now. <laughs> <laughs> you know why it might not be on my, it might be, but why it might not be on my list is because, you know, it's not a gateway game, it's a serious game. It's you know, a serious I, I game. I take it very seriously. You serious. can put serious games on a gateway game. That's, That's true, fine. yeah, I know. I'm just kicking myself and making <laughs> excuses now for not having it. Whoopsie. My number one is Pitch Cat. Can I right. have a number zero? No, no, carry uh, on, carry on. Okay. What's, what's your number seven? Seven. I love cats. You love cats. I love I love cats. I love cats. You love cats. I love cats. And the Isle of Cats. Oh, the Isle of Cats. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I totally forgot about this one. This is a good mm -hmm. one. No, but you're kicking yourself too now. Yeah, I, I think, um, tell us about Isle of Cats. Specifically when you're pay playing the base variant of the game, mm. it is a really good introductory game. poly style of gameplay where you're taking tiles of certain shapes almost in a tetris kind of way mm. and you're trying to fit it onto your board you know, in a certain sequence as well. You, I think for a poly omino style of game, I prefer it over Patchwork. I agree with you. And Uwe Rosenberg is probably my personal favorite sort of exclusive board game designer. I think for Isle of Cats, I enjoyed more than Patchwork. Yeah, it's so cool. You got all these cool cats on it. It's based on that old Japanese kind of, is it mythology? I think it's mythology. I don't think it was based on real island of cats, was it? I'll have to look this up now and find out if these cats were really stranded <laughs> yeah, on an island. Drop us, a, drop us a comment if you know the answer to this, because I don't. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Brilliant game in getting the family involved. I think just having the cool artwork on the board as well. You've got your boards and everyone has their own little board and you've all got your own little mission to try completing your board the best you possibly can. Getting onto certain tiles before others do as well. It's a brilliant game. I, I couldn't agree more. It's a, it's a fantastic game, but not as good as my next game. So my number seven, I, I, I want to give this a, a bit of a, a pre-warning. You know. It's never a good time. <laughs> Go ahead. So this is a reasonably crunchy strategy game, but I think it works as a gateway game and I will explain why. Okay. So my number seven pick is Wingspan. Yeah, okay. I, I see, I, I can understand your angle. Yeah, um, yeah no. and it's certainly an angle that I've taken on this. It is so an angle. I, I'm not sure many you people- just wanted to mention Wingspan, didn't you? Well, we haven't mentioned Wingspan on a list uh, as an actual pick mm. so far, but I think it works well in this list because it is, like I was saying, a gateway game is sort of a gateway into mm. other games. And I think this is probably the best example of a gateway into a 
proper strategy game, engine building game, yeah. or Euro style game. Because one, it has an extremely broad appeal. Nature and animals, yeah. ev like the whole space loves this. There's a reason why Wingspan is one of the most popular games of absolutely all time, mm -hmm. right? Probably the most in the niche board gaming. Yeah, it, in, in terms of yeah. hobby board yeah. gaming, well, as, as soon as we sort of ignore like Monopoly, Scrabble, and all of the mm -hmm. really mainstream board games, yeah. Wingspan might be the best-selling board game. Mm -hmm. Your point is solidified by the fact that if we're talking about real gateway games for a lot of people out there in modern times, this was probably the game that got them into board gaming. Yeah. There's so many people that have come into my shop and they're like, oh, you know what, I played Wingspan with my friend mm -hmm. um, and I wasn't interested in board games, but that was really good. Yeah. Um, it was really, really excellent. And I'll be honest with you, it's probably not the most exciting engine building game that I've ever played. I've never played it. You've never played Shock it? Well, you've played Wingspan. I've played Wingspan, played Wingspan. Yeah, that is cool. There's just so many things that it does right that make it such a complete and wonderful experience the yeah. artwork's beautiful the game design is extremely well designed and is really fun it has a beautiful production and it's a pretty reasonable price for the experience too mm. it's not an overly expensive game i think we sell for like 45 quid 50 quid something like that a lot of replayability you know? extremely mm. replayable i might put a, a slash at the end of my pick and say wormspan wormspan is slightly more complex than wingspan not like drastically so. Mm. Decide which of the themes appeals to you more. If it's dragons, go for worm plant. If it's birds, go for wingspan. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I agree with you. I, I would personally pick worm span. I think possibly Wingspan might have a slightly broader appeal. I'm not sure which one outsells which one at the moment. Probably Wingspan still. Do you think so? Yeah. I don't... We haven't had Wormspan in stock for a while. It's just kind of sold out. I think let it stabilize. Um, and we might be able to decide. It should be like my first strategy game or something. It works extremely well as that. So that is why it was my pick for number seven. That's a good pick. I'll give you that one. My number six, I don't think it's going to be on your list. Okay, what is it? Because I kind of almost totally forgot about it until I walked into our library and mm -hmm. I was like, oh yeah. <laughs> Galaxy Trucker. I actually thought about this oh, one. About I did it? actually think yeah. about this one because it's it's not quite a programming, oh, it's not really a programming it's game, no. but it kind of gets that feeling of a programming game. But anyway, yeah. I'm taking the land uh, from you. Why do you tell us about it? Galaxy Trucker, it is absolutely hilarious. Basically two games in one. The first part of the game, you and your group of friends are all frantically trying to grab these tiles, which are all placed upside down. And then you, you're only allowed to pick one, look at it. You can place it as your ship component. So you're trying to build your ship at the start a spaceship and you can either choose to keep it and lock it into a location on your board or put it back down face up and everyone's kind of ah, like this no look no no i don't want this yeah i want this no and everyone's just going crazy at the yeah. start then once you've built your ship you take off into space with your ship and you fly around through the galaxy trying your best to avoid all these obstacles that the game is trying to throw at you Asteroids could come and damage your ship and aliens might attack you and take your people and it is absolutely crazy and it's not a hefty game to learn like literally grab tiles place fly off flip a deck do what the deck says try to get as much of your ship to the final destination as possible it is so simple it is one of our favorite game designers as well. We're literally listing off all our, our top three game designers at this point, which is of Lada, absolutely epic game designer. He's done some of our, our absolute favorite games of all time. This though, for a gateway into, what is it a gateway into? I don't really know. I think it's more a gateway of just getting people to realize that you can have that much fun with a board game. Yeah, I, I would totally agree with you on that one. Like this is generated, it's only a last for us. Mm -hmm. And the, the, I remember a reaction that we got from our, one of our friends who isn't like a huge board gamer. It was like, oh, you know what? That was just so much fun. That's what I want to do when I play board games. It takes all the boxes for that. That is a gateway. Like it success, successfully opened a gateway for, for that person. And there's no other game like it. Like I have to give him so much credit. Like some of Vlad's games are like truly unique. They had a refresh um, with new artwork that looks fantastic. We haven't played that version, no. but you don't need that version. It doesn't change the gameplay. Mm. It's great, pick it up. Get it. I think this was one of the first games that we also picked up because it's quite a small box game. It's a bluffing game. And I felt that there was a need to put well, at least one bluffing game in this because mm. they work so well as gateway games because everyone sort of understands the idea of poker or they played other sort of bluffing style games and in like with playing cards and stuff. Of course, the game is Skull. So you're gonna say cockroach poker? <laughs> <laughs> no. Okay. We've talked about Cockroach Poker too much yeah, recently. Skull yeah, yeah. is amazing. The thing is, I considered some other bluffing games, but I'll come back to them. The reason I picked Skull is because of its simplicity. Mm -hmm. You literally can teach the rules within five minutes, and it is beautiful. It looks like a, a hand of like coasters that are like really beautifully designed, like they use the whole Day of the Dead style mm -hmm. artwork on it. And it is just so much fun. The actual system itself, in truth, 
you don't really need like to buy a board game. Mm -hmm. Not that I wouldn't suggest buying the game, I highly suggest to buy the game. It's inexpensive, it's like 20 quid or something. Oh, like 20-ish dollars. So the way the game works is that you give, you're given these hand of coasters and one of them will be a skull coaster that will be on the, uh, the flip side of the, the coaster. On the back side of the coaster, they all look exactly the same. So you have to put one coaster forward and it goes to your opponent who puts one coaster forward and the whole, it goes one round mm. and everyone puts a coaster forward. And then at that point, you can choose either to put a bid in of the number of coasters that you think you can reveal without revealing a skull mm. or place another coaster down. So you don't know what coaster that people are putting down because mm. they're putting it down based down. But one of the tricks to it is that you have to then reveal your coaster first. So like it could come back around to me who I might have been the first person. I said, all right, I'm going to reveal three coasters and it's going to go to you. And you're like, hmm. You have to decide, am I going to reveal four coasters? You'd have to outbid me, or you could pass. If everyone passes, then that bid plays out and see if they can reveal that many coasters. If somebody outbids you, then they have the chance to. Mm. I could play a coaster down and say, oh, I'm going to I'm gonna bid two uh, to try and get the ball rolling on the bids. If it fizzles out, mm. then you literally have to reveal your coaster first and you've revealed the score, ruining the game. So there's, there's, there's so much depth in such a simple, Extremely, extremely simple game. It's so slickly designed. It is a hard thing to actually achieve. You only have to do it twice yeah. to win the game. You can imagine how hard it is actually to reveal coasters yeah. and have the high speed yeah. and not reveal a skull. Yeah. I think it's a great pick, to be honest with you. Yeah, Bluffing is one of the best genres of games, and I think this is probably the easiest one to pick up. Saad, you've had some really good picks. Where do you buy all of these board games from? I buy all my board games from Gathering Games. Why not check us out at gatheringgames.co.uk where you can buy all of these board games and everything tabletop games right here, delivered to your door here in the UK. By the way, you'd be supporting us and letting us carry on the work that we can do. Thank you so much. All right, what's your next pick? My number five pick mm -hmm. is a proper game. My pick is Cascadia. Cascadia, yeah. I think that of recent times, and it's not a game that got me into board gaming personally. It wasn't mm -hmm. my gateway game, but it's a game I have seen get a lot of other people into the hobby space and in such a brilliant way. The game itself is really simple. You basically, you reveal a bunch of tiles and you, you, and you have a bunch of animals below them. You have to take a set and then you place it onto your kind of reservation area. You're building out your own landscape as it were, but trying to score combo points. So you'll have a certain set of cards which can differ as well. So there's a lot of variability. So you've got a certain set of cards which are basically scoring methods. So they're different animals and it tells you how the animal scores. So That's right. So you take yeah. the animals, you place them on your nature reserve. And if you can place them in the arrangement that they like, mm -hmm. then you score bonus points. Really simple game, really easy to pick up. It has different modes in it. So it has an easy mode. So first time playing games, play that mode, very straightforward, a lot of fun. But then once you get a bit more into the game, a bit more, once you get a bit of a better understanding of the game, it lets you open it up into more variability. So kind of harder kind of scoring methods or more trickier kind of situations. Yeah. The strategy in the game is brilliant. You've got the tile placement and then trying to work out what is my best way to combo off of my placement. <sighs> amazing. It is a really amazing game. When we first played it, we kind of played the, the sort of normal mode, but then we had a look at like the easy mode and it's kind of like a kid's mode. So it basically mm -hmm. turns into like a kid's game, which is fantastic. But then it could scale up all the way to this sort of like reasonably high complex mm -hmm. or tile placement game. It takes a lot of boxes. You're right. I think we were well into board games when it finally came out, mm -hmm. when, when Cascadia did launch. So it wouldn't, didn't act as a gateway, but I've had a lot of people say to me, Cascadia, I played that, I absolutely loved it. And I can see why. Tile placement as a as a genre, as a, as a mechanic in board games is really exciting because you're sort of very visually building something mm. and you get that sort of reward from seeing like your little work of art, you know, just build and grow. Cascadia gives you that sort of immediate gratification. The reason I've ranked it so high on the list, not only is it a great gateway game, but it's a game you're gonna come back to again and again and again. And I think we've definitely proven that in the sense that it wasn't a gateway for us, but it was a game that we got into once we were quite deep deep into board games yeah. and now all of a sudden it's a game we will go back to. You want a quick game? Yeah, cool, let's play Cascadia. Yeah, that's an, that's an interesting criteria to consider because I'm looking back at my list and I'm thinking how many of my games can I apply that to? Um, I think all but one. I like High Society, I still really like High Society, but if I was to play uh, a bidding game, I would personally pick a different bidding game. Mm, like, in, oh, bloody hell. That's a great game. Nidavellir is a fantastic mm. game. Yeah, I would pick that over. What was the one um, um, with the chimneys? Furnace. Mm. Furnace. Furnace is Furnace. also one of the uh, best bidding games I've ever played. Modern art. Like, yeah. it, I wouldn't call it a gateway game, but it's, it's like somewhat of a bidding game. It's, yeah. Yeah. It has a bit more depth to it yeah, than yeah. that, isn't it? It's yeah. almost like a stock market manipulation yeah, game, yeah. isn't it? Like, that's, uh, <laughs> besides that, I think I would pick any of them. So my pick 
for number five is another Vlada game. We keep talking about Vlada. He's amazing. He's an incredible designer. There's lots and lots of games that needs to be mentioned by him. We should do a whole video on him. We should. But of course, the game I'm talking about is Codenames. We've mentioned it before. It's a fantastic party game. It's a fantastic game to play with non-gamers and it works so well as a gateway because it's so universal. It just takes a simple idea where you're trying to link words together and give a clue to your teammate. I think the, the team element of this probably really enhances it and it gets people mm. excited as well because I think people like playing in teams. I think one of the things that can be intimidating about board games when you initially play is like, oh, you know, I, I'm not I'm not very great at making decisions for these like strategy games or anything like that. Maybe you, you could help me along the way. So. Cooperative games can can solve that issue, but then one of the major issues with cooperative games is that then you then get the alpha or the quarterback, the person who sort of drives the whole, all of the decision making, takes the fun out of it. Whereas team based games actually just make it way more exciting. Like it kind of balances both of those things. Mm. You have competition, but you have cooperation too, and that's why I think one of the reasons why Codenames is such a success. It's really simple. You have a grid of words, and you're trying to make associations with the words. You can give a clue as one word and one number. And the number is the number of cards that's being shown to you that it's related to and the clue is the word that associates those. So simple and so addictive and so fun. Every time that we play this with our family, they've had so much fun with it and our family is mostly made of non-gamers, but they still want to play that game and they get addicted mm -hmm. to it and want to carry on playing that game. And isn't it just so funny when you accidentally choose the assassin, which is the card that you have to <laughs> avoid, otherwise you immediately lose the game. And I am totally guilty of accidentally giving clues that guide you towards the assassin. Yeah. <laughs> so keep out, keep an eye out for the assassin. It's a great game. I would be surprised if you didn't at least consider this game. I 100% considered the game, but it didn't make it in my list. Mm. The reason being, I didn't consider it a gateway game per se. Mm -hmm. I thought it's a brilliant kind of party game, family game, get everyone involved game, that kind of thing. But I just thought, what is it really, you know, a gateway game is something that introduces you to certain mechanics per mm. se. I didn't think there was mechanics in that game, which translated into many other games, you know, within the genre. That was the only reason I didn't pick it. I, I think it's just a gateway into the hobby. Yeah, no, um, that's Probably fair. lots of party yeah. games use words um, yeah. and the theme of words. Yeah. So I think it sort of introduces you to party games. Yeah. It's one of the best party games, yeah, without a doubt too. Um, hence why I think it works as a gateway game. But mm. you're right, there's no game that's quite like it. Mm. The closest I can probably think of is like Decrypto, but that's still mm. quite a different game. It is that right? <laughs> Okay, my number four is an actual gateway game. An actual gateway An game. An actual gateway game. <laughs> <laughs> Carcassonne. Okay. Disagree with me. Silence. It is one of the OGs. Yeah. It is one of the original four pillars of board games. Mm. Carcassonne. So you've got the whole tile placement element and then the city building element of the game. Many games have followed. Many games have copied the mechanic and done very original things with it. But to really get a grasp of why it's important, play Carcassonne first. It, I'm pointing over there because the game's literally just over there. It is such a simple game. Literally, pull tile, out of bag, place on a central board the best way you possibly can do. And then place your meeple on that tile to indicate that you have claimed the tile or whatever you might be claiming off of the tile. It could be a road, it could be a castle, there's so many different things. And it's such a simple game. One of the first games we played, it probably was the first of the four pillars of board games. So I don't think I played Ticket Ride before then. I might play Catan before then. Um, yeah, Catan maybe, but we weren't huge fans of Catan. Still probably aren't the biggest fans of Catan. Whoops. We'll come back to the list of board games we don't like eventually. <laughs> I think it was the first. I think it was before Ticket Ride, before Pandemic, I played Carcassonne. I think it was, yeah. And it's probably the most successful of those games, acting as a gateway to, to board mm, games. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, I love Carcassonne. I've even bought expansions for the game. So once again, great introductory, but then a game that you can just expand on. It doesn't need to stay an introductory game. It can become something so much more. It's probably a reasonable thing to say that Carcassonne is one of the single most iconic board games of all time. 100%. I think it penned the term Meeple. 100%. I think it might have been the first mm. um, game to ever call a wooden piece shaped as a person a meeple and it has become sort of ubiquitous and universal that term yeah. um, in, in board games. Iconic game, it is something that everyone should have yeah. in their collection and if you've never played a board game before, it is an amazing place to start. You will not be let down. Do it. Okay, my number four. I really felt I, there was need to mention one deck building game because deck building games really worked as a gateway for board games for me as well. Mm -hmm. deck for both of us. 
Yeah, I think for both of us. Mm. It actually worked as somewhat of a gateway for TCGs for me as well. Mm -hmm. Although I, I was sort of aware of the TCG market, I, I wasn't really into like paper TCGs before right, getting mm. into deck building games. And I just, mm. from playing them, I realized just how much fun like drawing cards from a deck and playing those cards mm. um, and having that dreaming experience mm. or how much it can be like. So this is a gateway in two ways. It's a gateway game for board games. It's a gateway game for trading card games. And it is, of course, I think probably the one that really got us into it. Can you guess? Star Realms? Yes, it was Star Realms, yeah. Because mm -hmm. we, we've had a lot of fun with this game. Yeah. I was so unexcited by the artwork. I thought it was a little bit generic when we first saw mm -hmm. the artwork. Yeah. And I still think looking back, it probably is a little bit generic looking. Like the minute to minute gameplay is so much fun. It's so gripping and exciting. And it's so satisfying, like building your deck. I think one of the reasons I really loved it is it's almost like, you know, playing something like limited um, or like draft of a TCG. Mm -hmm. So like Magic, for example but on the fly and mm. then playing it out as you're sort of drafting yeah. and building your deck. I just love that. Deck building is fun, battling is fun, finding synergies within mm. cards is fun. Yeah. Um, and it's quite a simple sort of synergy system where it uses four factions, at mm. least in the base game. You pick one faction, at least one faction, mm. which is one of the colors, and it will generally synergize with other ca uh, cards of those colors. But you can pick another faction, and mm. probably don't want to pick a third faction, but you, you can pick another faction, and that has a different effect. So which is kind of similar to like magic colors, mm. right? The magic color pack. Um, they have different effects, they yeah. kind of synergize with each other. That's how it works, but it's also a deck building game. So you're picking from a trader, taking that card, it goes into your deck, mm. you cycle through your deck, and then you get more cards, you keep playing them, you're adding to your deck and taking away from your deck. So you can't Constantly sort of adjusting your deck, your mm. deck on the fly. Mm. Deck building games have just taken over, haven't they, recently? Hybrid deck building games, which is everyone's going crazy. Like one of the best selling games of the last year has been Dune Imperium Uprising, which is a hybrid deck building game. It was hard to pick one because I have played a lot of deck building games. And I actually don't think this is my favorite deck building game, but I think it worked best as a gateway mm. to the genre, which is an important part of board gaming history mm. at this point. Important that you you have tried deck building games. Historically, I think the most important one is probably gonna be Dominion, which is probably the other obvious choice. It was really hard to pick between the two. I wouldn't be surprised if you picked one of those two in your list as mm. well. Dominion was probably the first um, deck building game as far as I'm aware. It has beautiful card artwork and really disgusting graphic design, but beautiful <laughs> card artwork. But the system is, is absolutely fantastic. I think Star Realms is probably a little bit more dynamic because it has like a dynamic trade draw rather than fixed cards that mm. you're always going to be buying from. Mm. I personally prefer that, but I know people who prefer the more static system that mm. Dominion provides. They're both excellent games. You should pick up one of them, if not both of them. I picked Star Realms because it was the one that worked as a gateway for me personally. So lots of cool. fun memories about that one. Cool. And they've got Star Trek Star Realms. Okay, I'm not actually a Trekkie. I have played this, but I think if you are a Trekkie and if mm. you're looking to pick up Star Realms, Star Trek Star Realms should be the one that you pick up. Uh, you're a Trekkie, aren't you? Yeah, I'm a bit of a Trekkie. You're a bit of a Trekkie. Yeah. I think you would probably like Star Trek Star Realms too. Mm. I didn't really understand m many of the references. There's probably lots of thematic elements that they've implemented into the gameplay and mechanics mm. of it that I didn't really see. But the person I played with really enjoyed it. I mm. think it's fantastic. Okay, Fez, we're, we're coming up to the top three. I have some honorable mentions. I think I mentioned to you, you should also write down some honorable mentions. Did you? Speaking of honorable mentions. Honorable mentions, yes. Tell me what your honorable mentions are. I mentioned Carcassonne, one of the four pillars games of board gaming. I haven't mentioned any of the other games in my list, so I will now mention them. Ticket to Ride, brilliant. Probably deserves to be on this list. I don't know why it isn't on the list. It would have been 11. It would have literally been 11, Ticket to Ride. So I put Ticket to Ride as my honorable mention, of mm -hmm. one of my honorable mentions. I was certain that you were gonna include it in your list, but neither of us have included it on the list. So I'm gonna go out and say, number 11 on the list should be Ticket to Ride. Um, and get the Europe version. Yes, Ticket to Ride Europe. I think that's the best version to start off with. Yeah. Brilliantly simple game, mm. yet just so much interaction in the game as well. And sometimes, yes, there's negative interaction, but you know, some of us love a bit of negative interaction. Okay, following that, I'm also going to mention it, Pandemic. I haven't put it in my list. And this is almost the exact same reason why you didn't put Ticket to Ride in your list, because I somewhat assumed that you would. But I might be incorrect, I don't know. It is a brilliant game. So I've also included Pandemic. It's so funny how much there's the, how much your honorable list. in the honorable mentions. Okay. Um, because Pandemic is slightly too complex, I think, to work as a gateway game. Because I think I've seen people who get too overwhelmed by the experience and it is a challenging game. The systems aren't overly complex, mm -hmm. but they're not the most simple, but it is a, t is a challenging game. Mm -hmm. From the get-go, it's a challenging game. And some people might not enjoy the experience of losing that might put them off, doesn't necessarily put me off. One of the reasons why I absolutely love Pandemic, and Pandemic is in the top five, mm. my, probably my top five favorite games of all time. I think if you're gonna lose in a game, mm. it's best to lose as a group. 
you know? It is, <laughs> it is. But if you're going to get really put off of a game because mm. you lost, then Pandemic is not for you. You're probably going to lose mm. more than you ever win. That's why I, I left it as an honorable mention, but it's one of the best cooperative games of all time. My third honorable mention, I've only got three, mm. is Azul. I like Azul. I know Fez is not the biggest fan of Azul. I like Azul, I don't love Azul. That's I, I really like Azul. I think when it comes to abstract games, it is the best abstract game on the market, in my opinion. Is it better than chess? Yes, I prefer it over chess. I have more fun with Azul. Is it better than... I get to play it with more people than just one other person. Is it better than Corridor? I prefer it over Corridor. People are used to the idea of games like chess and all these abstract games being a board game. So something like Azul being introduced to someone who's only ever seen chess or checkers and stuff like that. It's a very good natural progression into board games and, be, and you're kind of like, oh, check this out. By the way, there's all these other things we can do. Like mansions of madness and go crazy and make up things in our minds and blah blah blah. It is a really good introductory game. It is a great gateway game. Is it just a gateway game? I don't think so. It is genuinely a game I still pick up and play today. I agree with you. I, I wouldn't necessarily sort of rush out to play it as well, but I do enjoy it. I think rush out play. I think Corridor is a better abstract game because it's probably simpler to get to the table and to, to start playing. And it's so easy to teach. There's literally two actions you can do. So mm. like if you, if you can understand two rules of the game or three, mm. the three rules of the game they can probably play Corridor. They're very quick, so it gets people very hooked to this experience and they want to play more. Mm. Whenever I've played it, I've found people really want to play that mm. over and over again. Is Corridor the one with the Pac-Man version? Yeah, Corridor does have a Pac-Man version. Yeah. I still haven't played the Pac-Man version. That does look enticing. Was that actually your honorable mention? It wasn't actually an honorable mention oh, okay. uh, because yeah. I'm not actually yeah. like hugely, hugely into abstract, abstract, abstract yeah. games yet. Yeah. Um, so I didn't I didn't bother mentioning one. Cool. So I'm just gonna go through the ones that we haven't mentioned so far. So Coup was a, a really important one for me. It was one of the few games that I bought myself as well. I just really like the cyberpunk style theming of it. And I, I was sold by the art before playing the game, but when I realized that it's actually an awesome, awesome game, a bluffing style game. Seven Wonders. I think we can mention both Seven Wonders Duel and Seven Wonders. Mm -hmm. I think possibly Seven Wonders is slightly simpler. It's complex enough, but also simple enough that it works well as a gateway game, but a game that you want to get people back to. The normal version of Seven Wonders, kind of, you, the more the merrier. Mm -hmm. I think that kind of, you need quite a lot of players to really make that one work. But Seven Wonders Duel, two players player only yeah and works really well i think especially with seven wonders itself as well just the card drafting element of it a very important mechanic in the tabletop space i would say and it gives you a really good understanding of why it's such an important mechanic mm. i've had a lot of games before seven wonders where it was like i'm drafting but i don't understand what is the importance of my draft really i'm just picking a card and go mm. but in seven wonders you really understand that okay this can then you know synergize with this or this can then trigger that if I do, you know, and then it's like, but if I give my opponent the you know, option to have a card that I don't want, you know, you might look at their board and think, this is too beneficial for them. This complexity of drafting is really well explained through games like Seven Wonders. It is, and you have to sort of credit the uh, fantastic artwork and great symbology. Um, I think that's probably what does that so well for it. I couldn't agree with you more, and that's a really interesting perspective. One of the other picks on my list, of course, was Sushi Go, which is another yeah. drafting game, mm. probably more simple than Seven, than Seven Wonders. Wonders. We talked about it quite a lot mm -hmm. recently. But it's a fantastic game, it's inexpensive, like 20 quid. Mm. Just go get it, it's like a deck of cards. You're drafting pieces of sushi to make a menu. So much fun. I did include Catan on the list. Okay. On my honorable mentions. Okay. I, I, I I sort of seesawed on my opinion on Catan. It's funny, we've seesawed in opposite directions on this. Uh, do you dislike it more? I used to quite like it, remember? Yeah, you did. I did quite like you, it. You very much pushed for it to be on the table and, yeah. and wanted to just play it. Yeah. The first time I played it, I was like, mm, I prefer Ticket to Ride and yeah. Cox on. I I'd rather play those sort of games. But I played Catan more and I, I think I enjoy it more. I don't think it's the best of its kind. I mean, it's an innovator game. It is the innovator game. Yeah. You know, we talk about OGs on this channel, but yeah. that is the OG. None of us would be here if it wasn't for Catan. It, it's, it's a piece of history. So I think yeah. even just for that purpose alone, um, yeah. it deserves a place on at least the honorable mention. So mm. Catan is a good game. You should give it a chance. But there's some other mentions that I'll, I'll have in my top three that I think trump Catan in its space. So we'll come back to that. Into the top three. To my top three. My number three is, once I find it, it's a game that's already been mentioned. So I won't go on about it too much. It is Star Realms. Absolutely agree with you. It was a game that was like, whoa, what is this? You know, it was one of the early games for myself within the hobby space. And it was like, you can do this with the deck of cards. It literally a deck of cards on the table. And there was this huge, expansive game around it. I learned so much about different mechanics. You had the trade row mechanic. 
you had this combat mechanic of attack and defense. It was so thematic. A deck of cards being that thematic, I felt, I literally felt like I have this base that I am trying to protect and I need this fleet of things. And then it's once again looking for synergies and combos and so many things. It was amazing. Still amazing too today. I can still pull that game out. I still play it digitally when I'm bored. I pull it out on my phone. Yeah, I can tell you got some fond memories of it as well. <laughs> yeah, I loved it. It, yeah. it was mind blowing. Yeah, I, I just want to play it right now. Too. Yeah, it's, it's really fun. I, I'm, I'm really it. glad I managed to yeah. play that game last week. Yeah. I really, really enjoyed it. Number three. Number three. So we kind of just talked about it in our honorable mentions. I was talking about Catan, and I think there's a game that trumps it. What I'm talking about specifically in terms of mechanics. Shall I guess? Let me explain that. No, okay. guess. So what I'm explaining specifically. <laughs> about the mechanics in Catan that is similar to other games. The aspect of rolling two dice. For action. Um, yeah, for your action mm -hmm. or, or resolving the effect on the board, mm -hmm. uh, depending on what happens on those mm -hmm. dice. So there's a few games that are kind of like that. Mm -hmm. Do you have any ideas of the game that I might Does have? it also have a similarity to Catan that it also has a global effect to your role? So everyone will benefit or yes. from it? Yes. Space based? It's not space based. It's, oh, the, it's probably the other one that you would think of. I like space base, but I think um, space base is slightly too complex to work as a Maybe, gateway. Yeah, yeah. No, My pick know. was Machikoro too. Oh, Machikoro, of course. Yeah. Yeah. So we got introduced this from a friend, and um, I'm very glad that I played this game. Mm -hmm. um, and when I played it, I realised that it's actually very similar in many ways to Catan. It's Catan but better. It's Catan but better. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I think it streamlines it more. It simplifies it more. It makes it more exciting. Mm -hmm. It gives it a bit more take that, which I like. You may not like, but I love it. No, no, I like it. Especially um, the take that element of it is really yeah, cool. Yeah, and it's almost got some elements of like deeper engine building too. Uh -huh. I think it does everything right. I think Machikoro 1 I played, I played it and I was like, I thought it was all right. And then mm. when I sort of thought about it deeper, I think the game is possibly broken. I'm not going to go into that in too much detail, but but in short, I think there's not a huge amount of reason to ever use more than one die to do your roles. Supposedly the expansions fix it. Yeah. I haven't played that. But Machikoro 2 very much fixes that and makes it a more exciting and better, stronger, overall, mm. grander experience. Yeah. Um, it's fantastic. I think lots of people probably agree with me because we cannot keep a game in stock. Pandasaurus, print more. It's, it's a really good game. I, mean, I actually don't even own a copy of it. And for me to, to put that in my top three and not own a copy of it, probably a big thing. Machikoro 2 should play it. Yeah, 100%. I, I'd agree with that one. Space Space, as I mentioned. Space Space is a great game. Yeah. Um, I think Match Core 2 might be your gateway to a game like Space Space. Space Space is definitely more complex and it's like engine building. I mean, there's definitely one disadvantage of Space Space is just how much space you space literally space takes space, up yeah. so much space, doesn't for it? For each person. Yeah, you need quite a large table for Space Space. You need space. a huge table for yeah. Space Space. Yeah, yeah. Match Core 2, that's not really the case. That isn't, yeah, that's not the case. They're both brilliant. They're both brilliant yeah, games, yeah. Both um, brilliant. Try Match Core 2 first. If you like that, then consider stuff like Katana and space space. As a gateway game, Match Core 2 is the best of those. That's a cool pick. I didn't think about it. I'll give you that one. All right, go on, beat that. Number two, you probably considered it. I think it's a game you've considered. I don't think you're gonna have it on your list, but I'm a huge fan of this game. Whenever somebody new comes to the table, it's usually like, let's play this, and I'll shove it in front of them and force them to play it with me. I think you have a game very similar to this on your list, potentially. Oh, right, I know what this oh, is, yeah. <laughs> okay, so, <laughs> It's a variation of games, but you can pick either one. Century Spice or Century Golem. The Century series yeah. is a brilliant collection of games. I'm gonna go specifically with Spice or Golem, the first version of the game. It is such a fun game. I've had people who've never played board games, you know, they're interested, they've got a bit of the, bit of the itch. So it's like, check this out, and then that is it. They're just scratching everywhere after this game. They I want more! <laughs> <laughs> it is a set collection game, but you're using your sets that you collect to then purchase other things off the board. You'll have golems coming out and you need certain gems to get the golems, but then the sets you are collecting are basically the gems to purchase the golems, or ways to get the gems to purchase the golems. So you, first you're working out, you play cards to gain gems and use them gems to then purchase golems. You, you get a certain amount of golems and then you call end game. Whoever has the highest points wins. Well, I would say golem is my favorite of the two, is the production level of golem. I just love those gems. They're so cool, those little gems. And then the, you know, the plate you get with it and then, you know, oh, it's brilliant. A cool game, really cool out. No two golem cards are the same. It is such a cool game. So simple it is literally play a card to collect a gem 
or spend your gems to collect a golem. The cards you've played, you can kind of do an action to grab those cards again and bring them back to your hand. Another one of those games I'd literally crack out right now and play. Is it an engine building game? Is that probably the best way to describe it? Because your engine is kind of like your hand, isn't yes. it? And that's what you're trying to build onto, make it more efficient for you to try and yes. get a gem and then score the big card. I, yeah, I agree with it. I somewhat disagree with it also because <laughs> No, I think, mm -hmm. well, okay, you know yeah, where this is yeah, going, yeah, right? Like yeah, so. Is it your number two? Yeah, it is. It's my number okay, two. So yeah. we might as well talk about my number two, which is Splendor, which is a similar game. We often compare the two. If it was to pick a game like this, I would pick Splendor. Mm. I, I think it's a slightly more exciting experience. And that's the only real reason why. I think it probably works a little bit better for me mm. as an engine building game because it has it as a tableau as opposed mm. to having it in your hand. In all honesty, if you pick one of these games, probably going to have tons and tons of fun with it. I've not seen anybody who not enjoy Century. I've seen, never really seen anybody not enjoy Splendor. Splendor is one of those games that I just keep coming back to and back to. Despite Splendor being quite a low complexity engine building game or just a board game in general, I keep coming back to it. I just keep finding like new strategies of mm. how to expand on this game, how to get keep getting better at this game. I love it. I love it. absolutely everything about it. Probably the easier game of the two as well. Like, Do you think so? I think so. You can argue that Splendor is probably an easier teach. They are very similar yeah. games. Splendor was the original of the two. I think Splendor probably looks a bit more exciting on the table too because mm. it has these beautiful chips. Yeah, the chips, the chips really, really add cool. to the grand yeah, experience yeah. of it. Proper poker chip. There's, there was a digital version of it, but I think mm. it sort of disappeared mm. off of like app stores and whatnot, which is a shame uh, because it's actually really, really good digital we implementation. We had some good times on that app. We, honestly, we played that game so much and I, I still play it. I still play it today, so. Yeah. I'm, I'm afraid to delete it because I know I'll I'm not going to delete it. I will never <laughs> delete that game. All right, go tell us your All number right, one. All right, number one. I don't even need to look at the book. I know what my number one is. As soon as you said, Saad, I need you to come up with a list highest recommendations for gateway games. You're smiling like you're worried, like he's going to pick the same as me. But I'm, it's more like I, I, I de definitely didn't feel this way. Oh, you did you not feel that way? Okay. No, actually, I, there was a really obvious uh, number one for me, yeah. It is a recommendation for me and it is a game that impacted me myself as well. I mean, I'll just come out and say it's Lords of Water Deep. The impact that had on me of understanding board games and the many different mechanics, specifically of worker placement, it was the game that was like that light bulb moment for me. I get this. So many games I've played after that, that I always relate back to, oh, this is like Lords of Waterdeep. And that is what makes the perfect gateway game. It's the one that you will continue to remember because it taught you about so many other games. And it's still a game I can go back to today. I will give the caveat that, yes, you, I would definitely want the Scoundrels of Skullport expansion if I do play that game again, because without it, I don't think I have the same feeling. But with that expansion and that game, I will still play it today. It's still an amazing play. I don't know what else to say. I actually did not consider... Um, wow. Um, What's not even a consideration. I, did, I didn't even consider uh, Lords of Waterdeep. It didn't even go through my mind, but I cannot fault it as a pick because you've really done well to justify it. And I am somebody whose favorite genre of board games is without a doubt worker placement and Euro style games. But most of them are far too complex to really put on as a recommendation for a gateway. I don't know why I didn't think of this. It's funny because Lords of Waterdeep, it's not my favorite game. It's not my top 10 strategy games of all time, but God, does it work well as a gateway to strategy and worker placement games? It is exactly that for both of us. It was the w first worker placement game we played. It's the first time we played a game like, oh wow, <laughs> like this is a real this game. Is like, so this is a real sort of strategy yeah, game. Really, yeah, we got to think here. <laughs> yeah. you know, and I, now in hindsight, it doesn't feel like that anymore. Mm. You know, because we've played all like the Uwe Rosenberg ones stuff and we've now. played quite a lot of the complex ones. We had to put work into it to learn yeah. it, but it made everything afterwards a lot easier. It really lacks in theme. One of the reasons why I consider Uwe Rosenberg as one of the greatest designers of strategy and worth placement games, there is no person alive that is capable of packing so much theme into a genre and mechanic of board games that is so generally themeless. And I think this is my issue that I had with Laws of Waterdeep that is very themeless. It's like, play this card, pick up this colored cube, then exchange this colored cube into this colored cube and pick up a reward card. And you can totally forget the theme of D&D &D and still play Laws of Waterdeep. You still have fun because there is that fun in just having the strategy, but it doesn't immerse you into the universe of D&D &D when I first looked at it. And I remember when we first showed this to one of our friends at the table, he said, wow, is this like a role-playing game? It's got this in it, it's got this narrative. No, actually, no, it's, it's just got a, none of it's that. It's got none of that. It's just a pretty much straight up sort of exchange this to this to this to this and mm. score points. Whereas when I played Caverna for the first time, I actually felt like I was growing a farm here and I was role-playing and had these mm. complex decisions of how I want to grow my mm. my cave dwellings and, mm. and, and my farm. Do I want to go the route of 
you know, making them like vegan. Like I, I even had the cho choice to like make them vegan as somebody who's a, a strict vegan or follows a strict plant-based lifestyle. I just found that so liberating that it gave me those that decision making. It made me feel like I all my decisions were impacting mm -hmm. this colony that I was looking yeah. after. Yeah. Felt so immersive and so gripping in that. But would you recommend Caverna for a first time? Never, back? never. I would never recommend it. Somebody said to me, I, I want to get into strategy games. I want to get into work placement games. Yes. Laws of Waterdeep is the one that I should, would recommend. Raiders of the North Sea, slightly more complex, but it, another, was, it would yeah, be another 100%. great pick. It would be another great pick. That's my number one. What is your number one? All right, that, that was a good pick. I think I smashed it with my pick. You did kind of smash it with your pick, so maybe mine's not going to be <laughs> nearly as exciting. But I picked the one that was really obvious to me and the one I recommend the most for somebody who's coming brand new into board games. It was Carcassonne, which of course you have mentioned. I think you have had the fondest memories of Carcassonne and it really made me so excited for the hobby. It's a competitive tile placement game we've mm. talked about how it works already i think there's just something so fulfilling about seeing that city grow in front of you mm. working together but also sort of against each other because you can kind of advise each other so you can you can play this tile here you can play mm. this tile here so it gets conversation going at the table also it's like a true board game mm. in the sense that you know there's victory points and you're trying to score towards a universal goal it takes so many boxes for me it's iconic art was beautiful production is beautiful there's a reason why this game has just continued to sell year after year despite being one of the sort of modern renaissance board games mm. the founder as pioneers of the modern renaissance of board games. It deserves all of the praise that it gets. It's a fantastic, fantastic game. It's simple, complex, filled with strategy, but works for everyone. It yeah. genuinely like, works for everyone, that game. It's a brilliant game. I think any of these games we've mentioned on this list, just pick any one, pick them all. You will have them in your collection for absolutely ever. And if you are looking to pick any of these games up for your collection, why not consider purchasing it directly from us and supporting us over at gatheringgames.co.uk. I'd really appreciate it so we can carry on making videos like this, which we enjoy so, so much. Like, subscribe, tell us, tell us your picks. What are your top 10 games to start a collection with? What were the gateway games for you? I want to know, and so does everyone else. Comment below what you think was the worst pick. No. And then, then we'll, we'll do a count up of the votes. Okay. Who had the worst pick? <laughs> How about that? Okay, fine. Let the audience decide. Worst pick. Worst pick was hard. Anyway, watch this video too. Ha <laughs>